So let's pick up our electronic systems with transistors. Last time we were talking about diodes, now we're going to move on to a slightly more complicated element. So think back to your diode. Remember it was a PN junction. Our P region is our P-type doping. Our N section is our N-type doping. The P-type doping is going to have extra holes, which are positive uh, charge carriers. And our N-type is going to have extra electrons, which are negatives. And so as we uh, look at this as like a check valve, if we put in current in a positive sense into the anode, uh, it's going to allow current to flow through from P-type to N-type and out the cathode. If we go the other way, then nothing's going to happen for a while until we reach that point where we just overwhelm the N-types and it breaks down. So what happens though if we stick on another N-type or, or P-type material? So in this case I've taken my P-N on the right and I've stuck an extra N on the left. Well what is this? Hopefully you said it's a transistor. This is a transistor. Let's go, oops, let's go back there. It is a transistor. Uh, it's going to have typically an N-type, a P-type, and an N-type, and that, that second one on the right is going to be an N+, plus, which is to say it's a stronger doping, it's more parts per million of the, the doping. Uh, you can also do a P and P, and those are our two different types of transistors in a, in a BJT sense, N, P, N, and P, N, P. Uh, we've got two different big things that we ask transistors to do. We ask them to amplify signals, and we ask them to switch signals. So we want to amplify uh, voltage or current using power from some external source, or we want to switch a relatively large amount of current um, between or, or voltage across two terminals using some control signal. So we talked about diodes before. They were great for dealing with sensors because we could rectify signals. We could do some signal processing. That's a great for sensors. But now we're talking about being able to amplify. We're being able to talk about switching things on and off. These are great for uh, transistors are great for dealing with actuators. Uh, so for instance, if I have a motor and I want to turn it on and off with a relatively low signal coming out of a microcontroller, well, I can run that through a transistor that will switch the large power required to turn the motor. So there we go. It's a nice way to control an actuator. This is for interfacing actuators, typically. Uh, transistors come in a lot of different packages. You can see, um, let's see, the, the TO220 is very similar to uh, the package that's, that's going to be on our TIP31 relatively large current transistors. Um, there's also there the TO92, which is one we'll use for small signal transistors. And as you expect, the larger the package, typically the larger the current capacity. So transistors connect systems, typically between low power and high power, because again, we're using low power signals going in and then amplifying or switching based on them. So my rule of thumb, and this is not hard and fast. This is my rule of thumb for things that we tend to do in class, but if you deal with other systems elsewhere, it may be very different. I consider low power to be on the order of 3 or 5 volts, around 10 milliamps. Things that you might use with a microcontroller, an Arduino, that sort of thing. High power, I think of as greater than 100 milliamps, greater than 5 volts. So things like motors, things that might kill you. Um, those are high power. Low power are things that, that are going to be signal level. High power are things that are going to be what we call power level. So your high power is going to have your actuators, your DC motors, your stepper motors, your solenoids, that sort of thing. Um, your low power is going to have your microcontroller, which is going to control your motors. It's going to read your sensors. It's going to process your, your controller uh, algorithm. Your high power might have some sensors, like our IR sensors that we use in class are, are relatively uh, large current draw, at least compared to the other sensors. Um, they're still 5 volts, but they, they pull enough current that we d typically don't want to run them off of the Arduino. A lot of sensors are low power. Your LEDs, uh, most of the LEDs that we deal with are, are low power. They're going to be, you know, 2 volts relatively low current, but some of the really big ones that you get, you might need to consider them high power. So this is, as you can see, this is sort of a wishy-washy um, sort of breakdown, but that's that's kind of how I've, I've got things separated in my mind. So what we do is we use low power signals coming from a microcontroller, for instance, to control high power signals going to an actuator. And how do we do that? We use transistors because transistors bridge the gap and allow us to use low power to switch or amplify to high power. 
we've got two major types of transistors. We've got bipolar junction transistors and field effect transistors. So NPN, like I mentioned, PNP. We've got MOSFETs. We're going to call it an N channel and a P channel. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these. But the big thing is that your BJTs are going to be current controlled. We're applying a current to the base, and that allows current to flow from collector to emitter. The base is the one on the left labeled with a B, collector and emitter, C and E. So we apply a current to the base, current flows through. That's our, that's our amplification and our, and our switching is, is that action there. Our FETs, though, we're going to apply a voltage to the gate, G, and that's going to allow current to flow D to S, drain to source, or the other way around. So current controlled, voltage controlled. That's the big difference between these two for right now. So a BJT, we can look at as a current controlled current source. We put in a current at the base, we get a current from C to E. So we have two different things that we use to quantify this. We've got alpha and beta here. Alpha is going to be the ratio of the collector to the emitter voltage, how much or current, sorry, how much current comes in versus how much current goes out. Uh, and so usually it's going to be close to one, it's going to be greater than 0.98. Um, and then beta is going to be the ratio of the current at the collector to the current at the base. How much are we amplifying? And so beta can be anywhere between 50 and 300, so we can get relatively large amplification ratios of signal at the, at the base to signal at the collector. If we put this together and look at the, um, the emitter current is going to be the sum of the collector and the base current. And so if we divide by the collector current, then we've got our, our ratios, 1 by alpha is going to be 1 plus 1 by beta. So we can, we can go back and forth between our beta, our amplification, and alpha, our, our ratio in to out. Um, they're, they're essentially the same thing, they're different views of the same thing. So we've got three different modes that we can operate in. We can operate in cutoff, where nothing happens. We can operate in active linear, where we're amplifying the current, and we can activate, uh, act in saturation. I guess my animations are screwed up there. We can act in saturation. And so the way I view this is a lot like a garden hose. Um, we are we're turning the, the um, knob on the garden hose, and that's going to allow water to flow through the hose from, from the spigot all the way through the hose and out to the, the garden. And so the base is, is how much effort I'm putting into that, that knob, and then the, the flow through um, IC there, the current through the collector, is how much is coming into the spigot. The, the emitter current is how much is going out the end into the garden. Um, so if I put in no effort, oops, if I put in no, um, no turn of the, of the knob, then there's no current flow, there's no water flow. If I turn it a little bit, then as I keep turning it, more water and more water is going to flow. It's amplified. And eventually I'm going to reach the point where it's all the way open. It doesn't matter how much I turn it, it's going to be the same amount flowing through, and that's saturation. Uh, so we can we can talk about the active linear region where we're amplifying the base, and that's the part where we're just we're opening the the valve, and it is uh, as we open the valve more and more, it's going to allow more and more flow through. And so in that case, we talk about the collector current being proportional through the beta. That's why we use beta uh, to the base current, and that's where we get large amplifications, and we have to talk about large power dissipations. Uh, in your ca uh, cutoff and saturation regions the valve completely closed or the valve completely open, then it's just a switch. And unlike the uh, garden hose example, where we have to turn it and we have to kind of go through those regions, with a transistor we can just bounce back and forth. We can say close switch, open switch, close switch, open switch. And so we can, we can do this very quickly, not instantly, but very quickly, and we can go back and forth between no current flow and lots of current flow. And so uh, it is, again, not perfect, but that'll allow us to control our actuators very nicely in a digital sense. So if we pick those two points, uh, A and B, A being where we're in the cutoff region, there's no current flow in this diagram, the output is um, at VCC because there's no current flow, and B where the transistor is saturated, and so the output is going to be our, our V sub CE saturation, which is just a small number to 
to represent the um, the saturated uh, voltage drop across the transistor. It's typically in the order of 0.2 volts. Then we're we're bouncing back and forth between roughly 5 volts and 4. Um, sorry, 5 volts and, and 0.2 volts, and so that's our our digital on off. So it's a current controlled switch in this case, and you can work out your um, your current through the collector and through the base here. Now I said it's not perfect when you switch back and forth. There's going to be some time associated with it. It's going to look very much like a first order system. There's going to be a delay time, how long it takes before the, the uh, transistor starts responding at all. A rise time, how long it takes for the um, transistor current to reach its 90% uh, of its final value. And then on the other side, there's going to be a storage time, how long does it take before it starts falling again, and how long does it take to all fall all the way down to 10%. So if we put in a step up and a step down, then the output, being the current, is going to rise in a first order sense and then fall in a first order sense with a delay and a rise and a storage and a fall time. And for a uh, 3904 transistor, which is something we've got in the lab, you're going to see something on the order of 35 nanoseconds for the uh, delay and the rise time, 200 nanoseconds for the storage, and 50 for the fall. And this is pretty, pretty typical. So we might talk about a turn on and a turn off time. The turn on and the turn off time being the sum of the delay and the rise and the storage and the fall times, respectively. Uh, so turn on is the total time it takes between when you send an input signal and when the output has reached its final uh, value. So that's our non-instantaneous timing for, for a transistor switching back and forth between cutoff and saturation. So here's an example for you. If we have something like this where we want to turn on the LED, and we're going to turn on the LED by flipping a, a TTL 0 to 5 volt signal at VN, and we know that our um, digital output can supply 40 milliamps. We know that we've got a 5 volt. Uh, I didn't write that in, but let's assume VCC is 5 volts. We can calculate using Kirchhoff, using Ohm, we can calculate what RB should be in order to protect the transistor uh, and the, the digital output. And I will leave that for you to calculate it, and you can check with me in class for the correct answer. Similarly, we can design RC and choose a resistance so that we do not cook our diode, or sorry, LED. Um, and so if we assume a power dissipation, we can figure out what the voltage drop, in this case 2 volts, across the, um, across the LED is going to be, and we can figure out how much current is going to go through it, and we design RC so that we do not exceed the current limitation. Again, calculate it out, check with me in class for the correct answer. So the other type of transistor I mentioned is field effect transistors. Uh, there's different styles of field effect transistors, but the idea is that instead of a current control, we're going to do a voltage control. And these are actually going to be very common. Um, a lot of the stuff that you, that you deal with these days are, are made out of FET transistors. So same sort of thing, we've got P and N regions, and in this junction FET, for instance, when you apply a voltage uh, to the gate, what's going to happen is it's actually going to squeeze that channel down, that little end channel in there, this one here, it's going to squeeze it down um, so that current can't flow. So in this case, um, you can see that it, it's symmetric as well, so we can, we can talk about current from drain to source or source to drain, but when we apply the reverse um, bias on the gate, it's going to squeeze the channel, it's going to stop the current. We also talk about MOSFETs, you've heard that term before, I'm sure. MOSFETs look like this, uh, and so again we're going to apply a voltage, and we're going to operate either in enhancement or depletion mode. Enhancement means when you apply a voltage, current flows. Depletion means when you apply a voltage, current stops flowing. So we are enhancing the current flow or depleting the current flow. Um, but we have almost no gate current, it's just a voltage. When you apply a voltage, uh, in this case, there's going to be, right here, a channel that forms between N and N regions, and it's called an N channel that forms, and that's what allows the current to flow. And since we've got very little um, 
current flowing, we've got very high impedance. You can see how this is good for digital uh, applications where you've got voltages but you don't have much current. Uh, so we've got a threshold voltage which is going to determine when things start happening. So when we exceed the threshold voltage, that's when the end channel forms, that's when the current flows. Just like the BJT, we've got a couple different regions. There's one more extra region in this case. We've got a cutoff where nothing happens. We've got an ohmic region, um, which is where we're, we're saturated. And we've got, uh, it's acting like a switch. We've got a constant current region, which is our, our active region. Uh, and we've got a breakdown region where everything goes bad and it gets too hot and it cooks. So, if we're switching, just like we switched before, we're switching between point A, which is going to be closed switch, there's no current flow, and point B, where we're in our ohmic region, and, and the switch is, sorry, point A, switch is open, no current flows, point B, the switch is closed and current is flowing. Just like before, we've got a little bit of a saturation voltage there, so we're not going to get all the way down to zero, but we're going to go um, somewhere between 5 volts and, and you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 volts. So it's a voltage-controlled switch in the same way that the previous one was a current-controlled switch. And we see that in things like CMOS logic, which you've probably heard of CMOS logic before. Uh, in this case, we've got two uh, MOSFET transistors. We apply a voltage at V in. If we apply only digital voltages here, so let's say 0 to 5, if we apply a high voltage, well, let's do the low voltage first. If we apply a low voltage, then... Qn is going to be an open switch, there's no, no current flow, and Qp is going to be a closed switch, uh, and this is because there are two different designs, one's a P channel, one's an N channel. And so you can see with the closed Qp and the open Qn, then V out is directly connected to Vd. If we do it the other way, we say Vn goes high, well now Qp is open and Qn is closed and V out is directly connected to ground. And so what you can see is the result here is that V out is the opposite in a digital sense from Vn, and it's an inverter. So we can do switching using BJT or MOSFET. In BJT, the current is proportional to the base current. In MOSFET, the drain current is proportional to the square of the uh, gate voltage. But either way, voltage controlled current or current controlled current. We've got logic both ways. BJTs give us transistor transistor logic and MOSFETs give us CMOS logic which was our complementary metal oxide semiconductor logic. These are two different logic schemes. They both work. Uh, they both have all sorts of different logic gates like inverters AND gates, OR gates, NAND gates, NOR gates, XORs, all of those. You can build them out of TTL or CMOS. Uh, BJTs are typically going to have your larger current capacity, but they're a little slower. Uh, CMOS are the ones that are real sensitive to static, uh, and they also are less prone to thermal runaway. And MOSFETs are more easily fabricated, which is why you're going to see a lot of them these days. And in fact, a lot of the things that are listed as being TTL are actually CMOS on the inside these days. So that's what I've got about transistors. We're going to use transistors in class for actuator interfacing and for logic, although we won't deal with the log logic so much as it'll be internal to the things we're doing already. Next up, we will talk about op amps.